In today's show, a peak off-season conspiracy theory plus one thing that a certain listener calls a fireable offense. Welcome to Lockdown Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, world? It's past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter Mike Richmond. You are listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making this show your first listen. Coming at you each and every weekday, Monday through Friday. So make it a part of your daily routine. Tell your friends to do the same. Make it your first listen as Locked On Blazers, your team every day. In today's show, it's, it's, we're talking to... <laughs> It's peak July. We're talking a off-season conspiracy brought to you by Chauncey Billups joining a podcast. Always decline those guest invitations, y'all. Plus, what one listener calls a fireable offense related to the Blazers' win-loss total next season. And finally, a question from a listener that was asked back in May, and two and a half months later, I got the answer to what skills can the Blazers actually build around on this roster yeah, welcome to late July. You are listening to Thursday, July 25th episode. And this one is going to start off a little silly. Um, I packed in some actual basketball thoughts to the back half of this episode, but we're going to start with kind of the goofy internet stuff du jour today. Brought to you by an appearance by Chauncey Billups, the Blazers head coach on the podcast, 7 p.m. in Brooklyn, hosted by Carmelo Anthony and the kid Miro. Um, it's a Carmelo is really good in a podcast situation. Miro is, has, has been a funny person on television for a long time, and the two of them together get pretty darn good interviews, and I think the Billups, um, the Billups interview is, is no exception. It's about 45 minutes long. They touch on a whole bunch of things, including Carmelo Anthony should have been drafted to the Pistons in 03, and probably not Darko Milicic. What it would have meant for LeBron James, what it would have meant for Chauncey Billups. But, but, the, but the program opens on sort of Billups as a coach. And I will link to the show below. It's uh, it's available on YouTube if you want to watch uh, if you want to watch it there. And I'll link to the show below. But the reason that it became um, a thing in the Blazers sphere is because there was a perfectly clipped social media, uh, you know, a part perfectly clipped for social media portion of portion of the show where where Billups tells an anecdote about he was coaching a team or coaching the team and he had a young a young player on the team who post who at halftime while the team was down 18 points had a dunk in the first half and posted their clip posted the the highlight on Instagram or he didn't mention the service but um that's what young that's what Blazers players use posted their clip uh you know on, on social media dirt at halftime while their team is down 18 points and they and it, Billups has to you know gets word of it as they're going back out on the court and it's like what are you doing get your ass back in there and like delete it oh sorry coach sorry coach and the clip is viral because it's a great clip and it's a great story and it's like you know who was that who did that? Who did that? Right. Um, the, 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 uh, this is like sort of the perfectly shareable bite size. Don't look into it type of content. Right. It's like, um, I had a friend who texted to me right away. I had some other friends who were asking me about it the following day. Like this is stuff that's like for, for, um, you know, if you are like me and I bet if you're listening to the show, you're not too dissimilar from me. You might be older, might be a little bit younger, but like, this is the type of stuff that you probably trade in. It's like, oh, this nonsense happened. But when this nonsense does happen, and it's just like a, an anecdote from Billups being like, a player on my team posted their dunk when we were getting spanked, uh, and uh, and I had to tell him to go delete it, and it's and it's embarrassing, and 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 so then the internet sleuths got to it, and I and I first saw the sleuthing on on um, on Reddit on r slash Rip City. Shout out to my shout out to my sickos on the Reddit. Um, and, and, and it was it was like quickly deduced by uh, redditors that it was likely Nazir little right and 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 if and if you go back and you, you can you can kind of find just like find a game that fits the criteria right in New Orleans so you're on the road it's probably only gonna happen one to two, two two times a year sometimes just one find a game when you're at New Orleans on the road getting smacked at halftime and somebody dunked in the first half and if you find it March 12th 2023, Nazir Little, two dunks in the second quarter. The Blazers are down 20 at halftime. And the internet sleuthers, 
They say it's Nas. It's Nas. You know, it could be some other people, but it seems to be probably Nazir Little. And that becomes the way that things work on the internet. That becomes the truth. Nazir Little did it. Nazir Little is the guy who posted on social media his highlight at halftime. But then, 12 some hours later, Nazir Little heads over to his, his Twitter account and posts the following tweet. I have never posted a highlight during a game in my life. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk, smiley face. Also, friends, you may not be as smart as you think. Don't trust all you see on the internet. Heart. Nas is like, dog, that ain't me. That is not me. I would not do that. Because it's kind of an embarrassing thing. So the internet sleuths get back to it. They get back to it. And they say, well, there's one other potential name that it could be that kind of fits the bill. April 7th, 2022, Greg Brown the third had two dunks in the second quarter of a game that the Blazers ended up losing by 33, only down 13 at halftime. It's, there's a chance that Chauncey Billups may have misremembered the halftime score. Greg Brown, he caught, I, I watched the dunks before recording the show. Uh, one, he cut baseline, had a kind of a dunk in front of nobody, and the other one was an alley-oop. I bet the Blazers posted the alley-oop. I bet they did. Greg Brown liked to post his highlights. Greg Brown once did an East Bay dunk, which is when you go through your legs in the closing seconds of a game, and the moment that the buzzer sounded, Chauncey Billups apologized to the opposing coach. Basically, as the dunk happened, sorry that my young guy did that. Greg seems like the culprit here to me. But I don't care. Who cares? Here's the point. Here's the larger point. Here's the larger point. Um, I would say signs point it point to it being Greg Brown the third but like um so the the dunk gate the posted dunk uh, I'm that's my branding here the posted dunk um seems like it was Greg <laughs> seems like it was seems like it was Greg but I think the larger conversation that Billups was having is actually more interesting than dunk gates like dunk gates funny dunk gates funny so why I'm leading the show with this funny it's funny like um okay a couple thoughts on this actually before I get into the, the larger thing if I'm an active coach of an NBA team, I'm maybe not I'm maybe not telling that story on a podcast. Don't go on podcasts. Um, if I invite you on my podcast and you're listening, please say yes. It's really, I do a lot of these and I need your help. But like, don't, if you're famous, don't do it. Um, if you're famous, come on Lockdown Blazers. Chauncey, I will ask you almost exclusively about, uh, about locker room hijinks. Um, I don't, I don't think it's a great idea for Billups to share this story um, because it only like what's there's no upside. Like it's a great story. And Chauncey Billups is a great storyteller. And if you're an everyday listener to the program, shout out to my everydayers. You know, the thing I like most about Chauncey Billups is that he's a great storyteller. I think he's really, really useful for media types like me, because when you ask him questions, he answers honestly. He thinks about him. He's a good storyteller. He relates to his past. He relates to his playing experience. He relates to his coaching experience. He's, he's, he's good at little anecdotes and he tells this great anecdote here. I wouldn't do that if you're an NBA head coach. There's literally no upside, no benefit to it. I guess it got me some podcast co content, um, but but like, and it was really shareable for 7 p.m. in Brooklyn's social team and probably got them some, um, like I watched their, I watched the episode because I was like, I got to see this. So I did watch the episode and I think actually the context helps a little bit explain why you would tell this story. It's an interesting conversation that, that Billups is having, basically saying that when he took the job in Portland, it was, it was, quote, it was perfect for me. I was coming in to try to try to elevate things. And I really think that's why Billups took the job. He wouldn't have taken this job. I've said it before. I'll say it again. The current Blazers roster, if you were hiring, Billups wouldn't apply and the Blazers wouldn't hire him. He's just not that type of coach. Um, I know he sometimes gets credit with being that from some parts of the world. No way. No way. He's an elevated good team, not a, a grinder that builds up a, a young team. But Billups admits that when things changed, he was still signed up to coach. He was this was still the job. So one of the challenges is like when he first had the job for the first couple of years, he had Damian Lillard. And it was like while he was having a little bit of maybe some challenges relating to a younger generation and kind of how they were and all those things. It's like he had Dame to be a liaison between like, OK, you're an active player. You kind of know this, you know, even if you're a little bit older than some of the young guys on the team and, and, and kind of um, understand the rhythm, like how that works. But when Dame left and it was truly young, Billups talks a lot about how it, it's just it was it's hard for him. And it's like he likes it. And he says there's still beauty in it, but there's it's a challenge in coaching and trying to learn how to coach a young team and try to relate how to try to 
um, try to relate to young players because the way you can coach vets, and I think this is why I keep saying that Billups would not take this job if it was offered to him, wouldn't apply for it, Blazers wouldn't hire him. The way you can coach vets is very different from the way you can coach young players. Vets, you might be able to be a little bit harsher, a little more like cut a little bit, cut a little bit sharper and say, this is what we need. Bleep, 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 bleep. But with young guys, you got to breathe into them a little more. They're just learning. They're going to make mistakes. They can't. You can't really just yell. That's not a proactive way to raise up a young team that's going to naturally struggle. And Billups talks about that. And he talks about um, you just, you know, one of the ways he, he's like, he, I don't even, the music in the locker room, I don't even know what they're playing. He talks about, uh, t- tells a good, a good anecdote. It's a great storyteller about uh, he listened to some music they were playing in the locker room and he didn't know who it was. And it was, um, uh, Scoot was listening to Yeet, Lake Ridge High School's own Yeet, a local Portland rapper. Shout out to the, my Lake Ridge Pacers. Um, and and like Scoot sent him like 15 songs to listen to. And, and like Chauncey was talking about relating that way. And then Carmelo Anthony brings up a story about when he played for the Blazers. And when he first got back into the league, and, you know, Carmelo was off for basically like a year and some change. And then the Blazers kind of rescued him from forced retirement. And it was a, it was really the, the Carmelo Renaissance was a p- pretty fun little story, even if the team was kind of stinky. But like I enjoyed the Melo experience a lot. Um, and Melo says like one of the problems, the challenges that he was having trouble with was like, he would get in the locker room at halftime and it's, he's sitting there with Dame and Dame's kind of an old head, but it was, there were still some younger guys on the team. And some of the younger guys on the team at halftime would pull out their phones and were just scrolling on their phone. And he was flabbergasted by it. But, uh, Melo said he was blown away that that was sort of a culture in the NBA, particularly for young, younger players, players, you know, 10 and 15 years younger than him. Carmelo Anthony drafted in 2003. It's like. He was blown away by what that looked like. It was, it was, it was just, um, and Bill, and Billups is another five years older than Mello. It's like, um, even more eight years older than Mello, but like he's a 98 draft, I believe. Um, and it's like, he's, uh, Mello starts to share the, inter- the phone story, which is why Billups brings it up. It was a conversation larger about relating to young players. And Billups was sharing an anecdote about how it's hard to relate to young players because they're just different than they used to be. But here's the real tip if you watch the whole if you watch the whole thing. Billups says that when he's like, I had to, you know, had to get on this dude and I had to yell at him and then but I can't really spend too much energy on it because I had to like coach the team. We're about to play the rest of the game. Um if it's the game, I think it is, they got thrashed. They lost by they lost the second half by 20. Um they were playing the game, I believe it is, they were playing CJ Ellaby and Drew Eubanks and Chris Dunn and uh and Greg Brown. Like this was a um, this was qu- quite a quite a squad. Didi Luzada was in the game, um, like, but he Billup says kind of he says uh, sort of under his breath as as they're ending the inning, and he said, "You're barely in the league." To me, that seems like Dunkgate uncovered is probably Greg Brown, uh, especially if if you believe Nas's truth that he denied it. Um, that's. That's your super summer controversy. I think this is a fun story because it's like about the challenges of coaching. Um, it's also a fun story because a player posted their dunk on Instagram at halftime. But I think the larger context, and I'll, I'll link the 7 p.m. in Brooklyn program below as as if Carmelo Anthony and Miro need promotion for me. But I will. I'll link it in the episode description for this episode if you want to check it out. Uh, because I think it's a, I think it's a conversation. Um, I think it's an interesting conversation from from and like Bill's perspective on like this is not the job he signed up for and the challenges like sort of on you know he's not only learning how to coach now he's learning how to coach a different totally different type of team uh and like don't 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 go on any more podcasts don't do it don't do it no upside zero upside sorry to to uh Jesus or sorry to Miro and and, and Melo uh uh Jesus probably not involved um Okay, in the second segment, I want to bring up a, a, a an email I got from a listener uh, who who offered the following few words at the end of a long email. Fireable offense. What could the Blazers do next season that is a fireable offense for some folks on the team? Join me in that second segment to find out. But first, I want to tell you that today's show is brought to you by Game Time. It's the place to buy last minute tickets up to 60% off face value when you buy when you use the game time app to purchase last minute tickets it can be to sporting events like that's probably what you're using it for if you listen to this podcast but it can be for anything that you need tickets to game time's got everything from uh, concerts to comedy shows to what have you all summer long and then when we get into the fall all fall long too because game time ain't seasonable it ain't it ain't seasonal it's reasonable um i screwed up my own joke there 
Game time, what I like about it is that when you pull up your phone, it takes you a couple clicks to see exactly the event you're looking for. You get a picture of the arena or the venue right there on your phone, and then what you see is what you get pricing. So it says it's going to cost you $60. It's going to cost you $60. There's no surprise fees. There's no, there's no convenience charges. It's just what you see is what you get pricing. Plus, they got flash deals and really... It, deals on everything. If you truly want to push it for the last minute, sometimes they got cheaper deals once the event even starts. So take the guesswork out of buying last minute tickets. Down, download that game time app. Use a promo code locked on NBA. Get $20 off your first purchase. Again, Download the app, create an account, and use the promo code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A. That's locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. It's game time. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right. So I got a, I, I did a show yesterday about the Blazers over under win total. FanDuel, a uh, uh, friend of the program, uh, the official sports betting partner of the Lockdown Podcast Network, released their over unders for every single team in the NBA. Uh, and uh, if you haven't listened to yesterday's show, go back and listen to it. But I'll tell you the number here because uh, we spent more time sort of talking about it in the Blazers' place and what it all means. But 21 and a half. Blazers over under for, for the season 21 and a half. Which seems a little light. Seems light. That's, that's not many wins. That's the worst record. That's the lowest over under in the Western Conference. It's tied for the second lowest in the NBA. Only the Brooklyn Nets, 19 and a half, have a lower over under line. The Washington Wizards also share that 21 and a half line with the Blazers. Vegas thinks the, you know, FanDuel thinks the Blazers are going to be one of the worst teams in the league. I think it's a safe bet that they're not going to be particularly competitive. Um, if you're more optimistic than I, that's. I like it. I love optimism, but. Um, I, or at least I champion your. Um, your decision to be optimistic. But like for me, yeah, I think they're not going to be very good. Um, you know, I think even if they were like totally completely healthy, 35 wins is probably too rich, right? Like they're totally completely healthy. I think they're pushing up in the, in the 32, 34 win range, 30. Like it's just, the West is so good and got better this year. Like they, almost every team in the West improved, maybe not Utah, but every, every, you know, uh, the other 13, in the West, 13 teams in the West improved, probably not the Lakers either, but it's, I've seen LeBron. He's still pretty good. Um, like, it's... It, Portland's probably going to be down there. And according to listener Garth, that's not like an outrageous opinion. In fact, I'm going to read you the, the following from Garth. I'm still not talking egregiously better than what the odds makers have in that, but 27 to 32 wins should be within the realm of possibility if we are to be optimistic about the guys on this team going forward. Hitting the under feels like it should be viewed as an abject failure, and that should be the end of this front office. A fireable offense. An abject failure, and that should be the end of this front office if the Blazers do not hit the over 22 wins on the season. And you know what, Garth? I like the vision. Not that I'm rooting for anyone to lose their jobs. I got, But, but I, I, I think I share the logic with you. Even if the Blazers are pretty bad, winning a 25th game, you know, going 25 and 57, that ain't exactly asking for a great year, right? And that would be hitting the over. That would be beating the over. Winning a, winning a 25th game would still be a pretty bad year, one of the worst years in, the, in franchise history. But it would be um, like... And, and I think even winning like, you know, 24, 25 games, which would be beating the over under, beating the line set in July, like it, it, you're still going to end up with probably one of the five worst records in the league. You might even be lower than that because I think the East teams are, there's enough bad teams in the East that they're probably going to feast on each other enough, like sort of evenly skilled teams in the East. Obviously someone's going to go way low, like someone's going to go way low. Um, but I think Detroit is kind of weary of doing that again, and they've added some veterans in, in Tobias Harris and Malik Beasley uh, and, and, and Tim Hardaway Jr. to kind of avoid that, right? To, to say like, okay, we're going to be we're going to have some level of competence. We're not going to lose, you know, we're not going to have a 16 win season again, right? San Antonio is better. They don't want to be that, so they're not going to be down in the dumps. Charlotte, it's hard to know how bad they they conceivably could be. Obviously, Brooklyn, I think, and Washington are going to be really bad in the West. Utah could bail and be like awful but if they play they've shown consistently that they're like a they're a team that's gonna win in the you know low 30s of games pretty much just like by virtue of having Lowry Markinen and a really good coach um so like I don't think there's a ton of teams that might change Cooper Flag might kill it at Duke Ace Bailey might kill it at Rutgers and then all of a sudden like the the sort of you see the Wemby thon but even like the Wemby year there were five awful teams in the league but not that many awful teams like the the league has done an okay job ending um, like 
sort of derailing teams from, or dissuading teams, I should say, from 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 tanking. They can't really stop all of it, and it gets really bad. And the Blazers haven't got the memo. They've been extremely aggressive. Maybe the most egregious team in the NBA in terms of like outright losing games on purpose, as opposed to just the Pistons building a really bad roster and hiring the wrong coach. Um, Tanking to me means losing on purpose, not just fielding a bad roster. I think what the Blazers will be doing at the beginning of the season is not tanking. If you're young and not very good, you're just losing games. It's when you are making up injuries. That's that's the T word for me. But I think I share Garth's vision with this. If the Blazers, if if you have faith in what the Blazers can be, right? And you say like, Scoot Henderson's going to be better. Shaden Sharp's going to take a step forward. Uh, you know, like... The Denny Avdia trade's going to work out, and he's pretty good. Tumani Kamara's going to going to help. Donovan Clinton is going to be a good rookie, right? If you if you believe all of those things, why can't they win a twenty fifth game? I'm with Garth. I'm thirty two is like probably I wouldn't I wouldn't go that high, but like 25, 27. Why can't they be a twenty five win team with like slightly better health and internal improvement? And so I, I I think I agree with this in in sort of on one side of it, right? I agree that if you believe that they're built, they're taking steps, right? Because you can't do it all at once and the Blazers need to be bad again this year. And I think they've, they've set themselves up to be pretty bad, but it's like, you can't do it all at once. But, but if you, if they if they need to take some steps in the right direction, some of those steps have to play out in virtue and like, see it on, see it on the court, win some games, not a lot of games, still lose 57 times, but like win, win some games, win 25 times, not that many, um, few times a month but like that seems to be a really good marker of a team that's that is getting some stuff right the the denny trade worked out the Klingon pick was the right pick shaden sharp is is rounding into a form that you know you can see okay this guy's going to be really good scoot henderson is it takes a big step forward after a very rocky year one all of those things uh you get the better version of deandre ayton than 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 the first half of the season you get the second half of the season da because he kind of everybody understands what he does and how to use him better than they did when he first arrived in Portland, right? That should be like a 25 win team. The problem is with abject failure is what is failure? I think we all agree that the Blazers want to lose the level at which they're comfortable losing. I think is maybe up for debate, but I think anyone who pays even like close attention to what the figures on the team say, every time Chauncey Billups talks in public, he talks about being young and not ready to win. And I think Joe Cronin has been pretty honest in the last couple of times he's spoken to the media about the sort of patience level it's going to take for them to be good. And he has not talked about like competing at a high level. He's been very, very earnest, open and honest about how they're probably going to be young and building and read losing. Right? Like, I think everyone's on the same page and out in the open. I think um, maybe the, the most richly optimistic among us think like they're going to overachieve. But 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 I think everyone who, who kind of follows it closely knows that like the team's expectations are very low for a number of victories. Um, and they want to lose. They want to they want to have a top one, if not top five pick, you know, top five or top one pick in the lottery next year. They That's what they want. That's the end goal of this season. So the only thing I'll push back against Garth is, is that it might not be an abject failure. I do think it would be a pretty bad sign if like, like say they say they've won 20 games, right? And then they get to the end of the year and they lose like 13 in a row and they end up at the under because they lost 13 straight to end the season, like really egregious. That might be a little different. We might grade that a little bit differently. But if they're not in the realm where like the final, like we're like juicing the final 15 games, like say say you get to the final 15 games and they need like a win to get to 21 or 22 and beat the over, then you would change a little bit differently. But if they get to fi- the final 15 games and they need like to go seven and eight to get there, right? If they're if they're a four, 14 or 15 win team at, at, at the at the 67 game mark, like if, they, if they're whatever that is, 14 and 53, then I think you could say, yeah, that's a failure, right? Because it's a little bit, a little bit different from when this team like truly pulls the plug at the end of the year. And I believe they will do that if, if they're not there or if they like pull the plug and otherwise they would have. Because the goal of this team is to get a high lottery pick. It's not a failure for the losses. But I think if you don't see the development and see some of that development in the victories, then I'm with you, Garth. I'm with you. I think that could be a little bit dicey. Okay, here's another basketball thing. We're going to close the show. Back in May... Friend of the program, the Reverend Dr. Jess Beals, sent me an email to the LockedOnBlazersPod at gmail.com and said, what are the skills the Blazers could build around? And I responded and I said, I don't think they have one right now, dude. Now I think they do. Let me share that with you in the third segment. Join me there, won't you? 
Still a pass first point guard. I'm still Mike Richmond. You're still listening to Locked On Blazers. Okay. Friend of the program, longtime listener of the program, longtime email, emailer of the program, the Reverend Doctor, Jess, sent me an email, lockdownblazerspot at gmail.com, way back in May. Said, hey, what what is like, you know, this is an idea for a show. We're heading, you know, heading into the, the light part of the season. How about this for an off-season idea? It's like, what are the skills the Blazers could build around, i.e., like, uh, Amphrey Simon's shooting or, or Scoot Henderson's passing? Like, what's a skill that currently exists on the roster that they could build, like, sort of, you know, Think about when they're building the team. Okay, this is the skill in mind that we should kind of harness to 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 craft the rest of the roster. And I I, I sent an email back as I often do. Lockdownblazerspod@gmail.com and said like, Jess, dude, thanks for all your support over the years, but like they don't have that. They don't have a, a, a they don't have a single individual talent that is good enough to build the boat around. They don't. They don't. Or they didn't at the time. But I will amend that because I, I do think my opinion of this has changed ever so slightly. At the beginning of last season, heading into the training camp, uh, Blazers at Media Day, everyone said as, as much as they possibly could, we're going to play fast, we're going to play fast, we're going to play fast, we're going to play fast. And then the Blazers had one of the slowest paces of any team in the league. For a good chunk of the season, they were the slowest paced team in the league. They played slow. It's not like they didn't play fast. They played slow relative to their competition. And that's tough because Scoot Henderson is not a good half-court player. And they're one of the worst shooting teams in the league. So you're not going to just like be able to, okay, well, hey, we'll shoot our way out of, of rocky half-court sets. Like They needed to generate easy baskets. And they were even playing slow when they were one of the league leaders enforcing turnovers, right? Like they still, even when they had those opportunities, they just they just didn't run enough. But if I could pick a skill, a sort of collective skill the Blazers have now that I would craft the next version of this team, the 2024, 2025 version of this team, it's speed. Speed. The promise that they made a year ago, they should fulfill. And perhaps with two new assistant coaches, they'll be able to fulfill that, right? Like perhaps a change in the coaching staff and the, particularly the the two lead assistants. Um, and, and like, I think people are going to have a pretty big say in the offense. It's like, can they get can they play faster? Because Scoot Anderson, he didn't show it a lot, but near the end of the season, he showed an ability to have some explosion and some burst at full speed. He didn't show it a lot, but it's there. And the best version of Scoot is someone who's going to play fast and use his speed. He just didn't use it much. They never found a way to, to, to weaponize it. Shaden Sharp is maybe a guy who plays slow in the half court, but he's able to fly. If you get out and run, he's able to run. He is a he is a transition player if if tasked with it. Probably not a transition player with the ball in his hands yet, but I think a transition like fill the wings, run, and get to the rack. Like he could be a, he could be an excellent transition weapon. Denny Avdia is the guy I think really unlo- unlocks this because he's a grab and go guy. They came over to, from Washington with the name Turbo, given to him by uh, Monty Morris, kind of ribbing him at the time for saying that he only had two buttons, Turbo and Shoot, because he just went, he ran fast and shot it. But it became more of, uh, as opposed to like a somewhat insulting nickname, to be a compliment, because Denny Avdia plays fast. He's a really good transition player, and his ability to grab and go as a rebounder, defensive rebounder, to grab the board, grab the board, and then push the full length of the court, make, court and then make decisions at full speed, call, call his own number at, own spe- his, at, at full speed, make some, some good reads and nice playmaking at full speed. That skill set is not something the Blazers have had, particularly at that size. Um, they, did, they just didn't have that skill set on the roster, and having Denny there will allow them to play faster. Scoot and Shea and Denny can all play fast. Jeremy Grant can play fast. He doesn't want to, but he is capable of playing in a transition style offense because he is athletic and he can finish through contact and he can shoot in, in as in in transition uh, game like he in, in in transition game like Jeremy Grant probably doesn't want to, but if the other dudes are on the court are playing that way, Jeremy Grant can fit in in a faster paced lineup. And I feel the same way about Anthony Simons. I feel like Ant has a lot of uh, Damian Lord in his game and that he wants to. Dribble, 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 survey, 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 dribble, 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 take it, you know, um, pound the rock and get up a tough jump shot. And, and Amphrey Simons is a good shooter off the dribble. Um, he, like he's a, and he's, he's a good offensive player, but like he's that his, maybe his preferred style does not benefit the rest of the team. I think you could play faster with ants. I think Deandre Ayton probably, I don't think you could play end to end the whole game with DA. I don't, I'm not, but like, he can run. He's quicker. He could be quicker than some of the guys he plays against at center. I, I think that's real. I think Tumani Kamara could be an, could be a, a guy who who um, thrives at that speed. 
you know, Matisse Thibel may be a little bit, um, he's not an above the rim guy. He's not a great transition shooter, but like he can force turnovers and, 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 um, and run. Like he certainly has the other athletic gifts to, to make it work. Like this team could play fast. So if I had to pick a skill to build around, it's the collective speed of the young players on this team. It's to actually commit to the thing that you thought you could do last year with more create, more offensive creativity, more commitment to an identity. If I had to pick a skill for them to build around, it's a skill. It's maybe not even like necessarily a skill. It's an attribute. It's a physical gift shared by many of their young players. A lot of teams, young teams in the past would shy away from playing quickly because if you play quickly, you turn the ball over more. There's more possessions. If you're a little bit less skilled playing a high possession game, was not, uh, you know, you want to limit the number of possessions because kind of lower your lower your chances. But in the three point era, we've seen more bad teams play quicker because you get high variance games, you get high possession games, you get more chances to shoot threes, you get more possessions to shoot threes. They might go in, and you just try to win the math. I'm not saying the Blazers try to win the math necessarily. I just, I think moreover they should try to maximize the strengths of some of their young players, and I don't think you can maximize what they do by being one of the slowest paced teams in the league. I think they have to get out of that, and I think they hopefully hired the right coaches to help them get out of what that is. Okay, you made it to the end of the show. You don't have to wait that long until you see the Blazers again, but it's going to be a minute. They announced their preseason. Um, they announced their they announced <laughs> they announced their preseason schedule, uh, and you got to wait till October. But October 11th, they play the Clippers uh, in Seattle. October 13th at Sacramento. October 16th back home against a German team, and October 18th their final game of preseason against Utah. Usually, the final game of preseason doesn't really count. Um, usually, the games against international teams teams don't take too seriously. So I don't think you'll see games in Portland that are. Um, particularly like dress rehearsal types, although, you know, you never know, but, um, you know, that game in climate pledge in, in Seattle could be fun. Um, you get to see, you know, Steve Ballmer, the Northwest own Steve Ballmer and, uh, and the Clippers and, uh, and, and that's a really fun arena. Um, it's, it's on a Friday. So if you want to make, make the trek up, you could go, you could go check it out in Seattle. That's how long it's going to take for preseason. That means we got a long run to get there, but guess what we'll be doing this show five days a week, whenever you get podcasts and also on YouTube, tell your friends about the program and come back tomorrow. I appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you soon.